Hi, real quick, before we get into the message today, I wanna to thank you for watching this message and jumping on our YouTube channel. I hope you're enjoying all the content, and before we jump in, I wanna encourage you to hit the subscribe button real quick and ring that bell. What that does is it makes you the very first to know all of the new content that comes out, and we'd also just love to hear from you. In the description, you can fill out the link and learn more and ask us any question you might have. Again, we're so grateful that you're here. Bless you. Let's get right into the message. Let's go to the Word together. Are y'all ready for the Word? All right. Give me a good amen every once in a while if you like my preaching uh, or if you just want me to go faster. Amen. Okay. First Kings 17. You'll make me feel right at home if you do. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. And as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, watch this, and bring me a bite of bread too. That's the most man-husband move in the Bible right there. Babe, you get me a little sandwich, babe, if you're up, babe. Babe, are you getting up? Can you get me a little something, babe? She said, I swear by the Lord your God, I don't, I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I, I only have a handful of flour left and a little cooking oil in the bottom of this jug. I was just getting ready to gather a few sticks. I was going to cook this last meal, and then my son and I would die. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Notice that. Elijah did not say make a large piece of bread, cut it three ways, we'll all have a piece. He, he said bring mine first. This is a God principle. The principle is that you put God first, and when you trust God first, seek first the kingdom of God. And when you do things God's way and you put God first place, you can believe that a miracle is happening in the kitchen. So use what's left over, prepare a meal for yourself and your son. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said. She and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour, always enough olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. So in verse 12, she says, I'm going to eat this last meal and die. But Elijah comes with a different word. He comes with a different prediction. He comes with a different prophecy. He comes with a word of hope and of life. And I want to speak that same word that he spoke over her. I want to speak that over you today. And I want to talk to you for just a couple of minutes from the, from the idea, it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Elbow your neighbor gently, gently, and tell him it's not over. Come on, tell him it's not over. It's not over. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Prophets in the Bible, God calls them seers. They, they see. God would take them up into the spirit realm, Ezekiel up into the spirit, spirit realm, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah. He would take them up into the spirit realm and say, tell me, what do you see? And then the prophet would say what they saw. God knew this was important because God knows that there is a realm beyond the natural realm called the spirit realm that is actually more real than what your five senses can detect that heaven is more powerful than earth and that the supernatural is more powerful than the natural. And when you get a word from God and you get a vision from God, you become unstoppable. That man does not live by bread alone, the natural alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That where there is no vision, the people perish, but where there is a vision, people can prosper. So God would give the prophets a vision of what he's doing and a word, what he's saying, and then they would declare that to the people. And when the people would get a vision and the people would get a word, they could make it through anything. And I want to tell you today that if you can get a vision from God and a word from God, you can do everything God has called you to do. Elisha was surrounded by an enemy in 2 Kings. And the Bible said that his servant Gehazi came out and said, My Lord, my Lord, we are surrounded by our enemies. And Elisha prays. 
Elisha does not pray, God, where are you? Elisha does not pray, God, help us. Elisha does not pray, Lord, we need a miracle. Elisha prays not for himself or for his servant. Elisha, excuse me, not for himself or his enemy. Elisha prays for his servant. This is an odd prayer. He goes, Lord, help my servant to see. Open his eyes. And when his servant opened his eyes, he realized that his enemy was surrounded by the armies of God. That his problem was not an enemy problem, it was a vision problem. That it's not always a devil problem, it's a vision problem. That maybe it's not a boss problem, maybe it's a vision problem. Maybe it's not a money problem, maybe it's a vision problem. Maybe it's not a marriage spouse problem, maybe it's a vision problem. Maybe what you need is for God to open your eyes to see what he's doing, open your ears to hear what he's saying. Because though my circumstance does not always change as fast as I want it to, if I have a vision and I have a word, I can make it and so can you. So what Elijah does is Elijah helps the woman to see. Here's the first thing I want to help you to see. You have to see your future. You have to see your future. Here's her confession. I'm going to eat this meal and die. Wow. Put that on your dream board, huh? That's a... (laughs) Make that an Instagram post. That's pretty pretty negative. I'm going to eat this meal and die. Let me tell you what that is. That's fear. Fear is believing the worst about tomorrow. Every negative emotion that you have about tomorrow is from the enemy of your soul. Because fear is predicting a tomorrow that you don't even know about. But it's declaring, I'm going to eat this meal and die. She didn't know that. Can we just talk for a second? She didn't know that. She knows it's going to be her last meal. She didn't know that her neighbor could have knocked on the door and handed her some bread or that God could have opened the heavens and made it rain or that God was sending a prophet to her. She had no idea. She was declaring the worst case scenario and she did not know it. Fear. It, it looks real. It feels real. My eyes are telling me it's real because I know there's nothing else in the house. But the spirit realm is greater. And what fear does is fear lies to you and stops you from believing what God can do. And you end up declaring a negative confession and a negative reality about your tomorrow that you don't even know about. This is what the enemy does. The enemy will get you stuck in a, in a falsehood, in a lie. And let me just say this about the devil. The devil has no idea what tomorrow holds. You know, the enemy doesn't know your future. Okay, let's talk about it real quick. Uh, let, let me say it like this. The devil is a, he's a, he's a present devil. He, let me say it like this. He is. Like he, he is where he is and he says what he says from wherever he is. And he lies, because Jesus said he's the father of lies, so all he does is lie. Like if the devil tells you the sky's blue, he's lying. Because even when he tells you a truth, it's from a lying spirit to bring deception. So all he does is lie. Everything he says is a lie. So he, he, he speaks from your present about your future, has no idea what tomorrow holds, but he lies to you and hopes you believe it. Tomorrow's going to get worse. This is your last meal. It's over. The drought's won. The famine took out your husband. Now it's taking you and your son out. There's no hope. He had no idea. But he hopes you believe it. He, He roams like a roaring light. He roams like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He can only be in one place at one time. And he lies to you in your present about your future. He hopes you believe it. And then you start saying the very thing he's, well, I guess it's my last meal. I guess I'm going to die, I guess. That's radically different than God. We just sang about it so you can cheat because you're going to sound like a theologian right now. God was. Hey. And he is, and he is to come. Like that's who he is at all times. 
which means God right now, see, uh, Paul, Paul said it like this in Colossians 1, Jesus fills time and space. That doesn't mean that he's in everything. He's not like in the trees. Oh, man, the trees, man. Oh, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right, we're not hippies, all right, amen. <laughs> What it means is, is that he's in your past, he's in your present, and he's in your future at the same time, at all times, working all things for your good. Say amen, everybody. He, he declares the end from the beginning. So when God gives you a promise, he's not hoping it works out. When the devil talks about your future, he's hoping that you'll believe him. When God talks about your future, it's already settled. When he says your family will be saved, they're going to be saved. When he tells you you'll be healed, you'll be healed. When he tells you I'll bless your marriage, he will bless your marriage. He did not say, I think, maybe, I'm kind of assuming the plans I have for you. God said, I know. The plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a hope, a future. God has a promise for you. This, so this is radically different. When God gives you a prophecy, when God gives you a promise, when God gives you a dream, he's not guessing. He knows. Everybody say, God knows. But this, this woman believed that because I've been in a drought, I'll die in a drought. Because it's been one way, it will be one way. Because, because this has been my experience, this will always be my experience. She judges her future based off of the pain of her past. And I just want to remind someone, your past is not your prophecy. That God can turn it. That God can change it. That, that just because it's been one way in your family doesn't mean it will always be that way in your family. Just because your marriage has been one way doesn't mean it will always be this way. Just because your kids have acted one way doesn't mean they're always going to act that way. Just because your job has been that, just because the economy's been a way doesn't mean it will always be that way. That I cannot judge tomorrow simply based off of one challenging chapter of my life. I refuse to let one chapter define my entire story. I refuse to let my past be the final chapter. I refuse to let one mistake, one low moment. Come on, somebody, say amen. I've come to tell somebody, your past is not your prophecy. God can turn it around. God can do a quick work. God can change everything. You gotta see, you gotta see your future. Secondly, you have to see your calling. I have commanded a widow there. Okay, uh, when I read that, here's what I think is going to happen. This is what it feels like is going to happen. Elijah's going to walk into town, and he's going to go, hello. And she's going to go, oh, OMG, it's you. You're my guy. You're the prophet. God commanded me to take care of you. I got, I got bread in the oven. I got, I got water. I got water cooling up. We're, we're ready for you. Come on in, brother. Come on in. Come on. Come, come get some food. That's not what happens at all. Elijah walks into town, and she has no idea who he is. Because that word command isn't really the, the best English word from the Hebrew language. The, the better word that the Bible, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the better word would be, I have appointed a woman there. I have, check this out, chosen for special use a woman there. I have anointed a woman there. That just like Elijah was anointed, she was anointed. And just like Elijah was chosen, she was chosen. I, I want to say it like this. Elijah had an anointing and an oil on his life that she needed. But she had oil on her life that he needed. That they actually needed each other. And Elijah had to obey God and she had to obey God. And when they both obeyed God, the drought lost its power. See, you really, you really matter. You really matter to the kingdom, and you really matter to this church. Don't get it twisted. There's an anointing on your life. 
You've been going through hell, but you've got oil. You've been facing droughts, but you have oil. You've been going through a storm, but you got oil. Yeah, it feels like it's your last meal, but you've got oil. The doctor said you're gonna die, but you got oil. It feels like there's no help for your child, but you got oil. This is not a time to quit. I have chosen for special use a people there that I wanna use to break a drought over a region. She's... She thinks she's going to die, and she's anointed. She thinks this is her last meal, and God has chosen her. She thinks it's the end for her and her family line, and God was just starting in her life. What could God do with you if you would just say yes? It's almost like God knew that if she could get in the atmosphere of the prophetic, she would respond with a yes. This is, this is why we, we, we so misjudge church and we so downplay church and we so belittle church and we so, we so underestimate the people of God in the presence of God. This is why you gotta get in church because you never know when your anointing is gonna rise up in a moment, when your calling is gonna rise, when, when a yes to God is gonna, is gonna be birthed. That's why, man, if the doors are open, I wanna be in church. Not because I always want to go, but because I know I need to go. Because there's an anointing on me that will be stirred by an Elijah. Because you never know when your anointing is going to rise up. That's what, I go to church on vacation. Why well, you're a pastor? No, no, no. I just really need Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go to church because I'm a pastor. I go to church because I'm a mess. And I go to church because I know there's an anointing on the inside of me somewhere. And when I get with the people of God and I start singing the praises of God and I get in the presence of God, I know something can rise up on the inside of me that says, there's oil on my life. That's why, that's why we want you involved. Some of y'all come to this church, why do they want me serving? Because you got oil. Why do they want me at least small group? Because you got oil. With your bad attitude, you got oil. Why do you want me serving in the next year? Because you got oil. Because there's something on your life that this house needs. Oh, there's no doubt you need a pastor and you have the best. But when he says yes and you say yes, that's revival. Revival is just a bunch of people finally saying yes to God at the same time. Come on, give God a shout of praise. I feel... Like I've come to tell somebody there's oil on your life. There's a calling on your life. You're not dying in this famine. You're not dying in this drought. There's something on the inside of you that the world needs. Man, I feel like a youth pastor. Once a youth pastor, always a youth pastor. You just keep preaching this way. I want to tell you about two, two people, Victor Frankel and Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was a brilliant man, but he, he was an atheist. And, and Sigmund Freud said this. He said, all people really want in life is pleasure. We just want pleasure. If you, if you, can, have, if you can have sex and you can have some comforts in life, you're, you're happy. That's all you need. Well, Frankel disagreed. And I think we can now look at a hundred years of opulence and disagree. Because there's a lot of people that have a lot of pleasure and are still not content. Millionaires who end their own lives billionaires that can't keep a marriage together, people with 10 homes that can't sleep at night. It's, 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 it's obviously there's something more. And so Frankel said, I don't, I don't actually think it's pleasure. I don't think the chief expression of mankind is just sex and food. He said, I disagree. It's not pleasure. What people really need and are craving is purpose. Oh, man. But when people don't walk in their purpose, refuse their purpose, or never find their purpose, they will end up medicating themselves with pleasure. It's okay to have some pleasure. It's okay to have a good life, but don't fall in love with it. Because pleasure will never love you back. Like, get the house 
Get the car. I love it. Get a boat. You get a boat. You get yourself a boat. <laughs> Give it a beautiful female name. <laughs> Betty. I don't know. Roxanne. I don't know what you, I don't know what you name a boat. I want you to, I actually want you to have a boat. I don't want a boat. I want you to have a boat. And then when I come out to Kentucky, I want to borrow your boat. Amen. I don't want to pay all of it. I just want to borrow yours. Amen. So I'm, I'm, I'm a boat guy. I'm a big boat guy. But don't fall in love with pleasure. Because it'll never love you back. And it'll rob you of your purpose. You'll go, man, I'm making all the money I could have ever made. I'm still not happy. Man, I married the dream girl. Still not happy. Man, I got the two kids. I got the boy and the girl. Still not happy. Man, I got the house. Still not happy, man. Because, because maybe you need something more than just pleasure. Nothing wrong with all those things. You just can't fall in love with it. Jamin, how do I know if I've fallen in love with pleasure? Well, here's a good way to, you can't give it away. The most miserable people in this room were the people that during offering went, oh, this isn't for me. I'm going to check mine. Yeah. The happiest people in the room were like, man, I'm blessed to give. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go. No, I'm serious. If you can't clap, at least cough. Do something. I mean, you know, some of y'all mad at me right now, but I'm serious. We, we resist we resist the idea of serving and giving and helping and lifting others. And we wonder why we're miserable. See, listen, Elijah could have knocked on the door and she could have said, no, this is for me and my son. And she could have shut the door and said, go somewhere else. And she would have died with a full belly and a broken, empty soul. But instead, she went, okay. All right, here you go. I'll believe, I'll believe the word. I'll believe God's promise. All right. And the multiplication happened in her surrender and in her purpose. So, so lastly, let's, let's end on a good note because point number two is kind of painful, so let's keep it moving. Number three, you got to see the possibility. See the possibility. It's honestly my favorite part of the story. Elijah walks into the village. He walks into Zarephath and says this. Hey, lady, can I have some bread? Will you give me some bread? And the woman tells the truth. I don't have bread. She wasn't lying. She didn't have bread. She, she didn't have bread yet. I don't have bread. I just have some oil and some flour. I, I have preached for years that God won't ask you for something that you don't have. And I'm kind of disagreeing with myself today because... Sometimes the thing God is asking for, I don't have yet. He, he's asking for bread, so I have to surrender my oil. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the bread yet, but I have the ingredient. I don't have the miracle yet, but I have the ingredients for the miracle. I don't have everything that I want yet, but I have the ingredients. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting to surrender this to God, but I'll, but I'll miss it if I'm waiting for the fully formed, fully matured, fully perfect version of myself. I can't always give God this. I have to give him this. But if I'm, but if I'm willing to give him this, he can turn this into a miracle because, because this is in this. And this is in this, and, and this is in this. And so I, I have to give God what I do have because maybe what God wants from me is not really some perfect little offering. Maybe what God wants from me is a yes. See, God doesn't need 
what I need to get me what I need. Really, God just wants surrender. <laughs> John chapter 2, Jesus shows up to a wedding with his, with his best friends. And uh, really quickly, I, I, don't, I don't know how quickly, but, but fairly quickly, Mary comes up to Jesus and says, they're out of wine. And he goes, why are you making this my problem? Well, now listen, I don't know if this is sanctified or I've just been in Las Vegas too long, but... <laughs> But something, something in me, I, I feel like Mary made it his problem because she's like, we had, we had plenty of wine. We were good until Judas got a little tipsy and John got a little emotional and Peter had to be the life of the party and we're out of wine. They were good on wine, but you're, you're 12. They, they took it out. See so you know what Jesus does? Jesus does not say, hey, hey, Judas, take, take some of the money, uh, go to Walmart and, and get some wine. He doesn't say that. Jesus does not say, hey, Peter, go, go hit up the vineyards, get me some grapes, bring them to me. No, Jesus says, Jesus says, can, can I have some water? Because see, if you want wine, you need grapes. And if you want wine, you need time, and if you want wine, you need wooden barrels, and if you want wine, you need a long process with perfect weather and perfect temperatures in a perfect scenario. But if Jesus wants wine, he just needs vessels. And you're creating a million reasons why God can't use you. And he's going, are you a vessel? You have to be able to see the wine in the water, the super in the natural, the, the more than enough and you're not enough. What God could do with what you do have. Because see, Jesus doesn't need what you need to get you what you need. He just needs a yes. Every time I preach, some of, some of y'all think, oh man, he must feel like Elijah. I don't, I feel like the widow woman. I'll be honest with you. Every time I preach, I feel like Jesus. You, Lord, you got a, Marcus wants me to come back. You got a problem. You need a, you got, you got to help me. There's going to be a lot of people there looking at me. And I've had to learn I've had to learn how to give God my oil and, and trusting him to make something of it. And I, and I look at my life right now and it feels like way more demand than I have supply. And in the natural, my life right now is way too big for me. It requires way too much money way too much stress, way too much smarts. <laughs> you like how I said that? <laughs> I said it like I got a GED, and I did. Amen. <laughs> it requires smarts. I, I just, I, I, got a, I got a GED. Don't, don't tell, don't let this secret out, okay? This is between us. I got a GED. Uh, it took me twice to get my GED. It took twice. Um, I just signed a, a book deal with, with Thomas Nelson, Shh, don't tell anybody, because they go, do you want to write the book or are you going to need a ghostwriter? I said, I might need a little bit of help. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, the dub, Some people have a double doctorate. I got a double GED. Come on, somebody. And you know what? I'm writing this book now with the top publisher in the world. And I don't feel like, I got the bread, I got the word, I got a life message. I'm always, I don't feel, I feel like, okay, God, here we go. We're building, we're building two buildings in Vegas right now. I'm going, okay, God. <laughs> I'm trying to raise a seven-year-old in Sin City, okay? I need a lot of that. I need to anoint myself. <laughs> And I like that because life is way bigger than me. But it ain't bigger than God. 
So I give God what I do have and I trust God with what I do need. It's not over. No, no, it's not over. This is not the end for you. This is not the end of the road for you. You gotta see the possibility. And when, when you surrender that to God, God will do what you cannot do. And the flower never ran out and the oil never ran dry until the time when the Lord sent rain. Listen, listen, I want the drought to break. I want, I want life to get better. I want America to get better. I want better, a lot of, I want a lot of things better out there. I want, but what's happening out there does not affect the supply in my house. Did y'all just hear me? Those interest rates can go to 20%. Inflation can go to a gajillion percent. I mean, I don't, I'm telling what God can do. Because no matter what's happening outside of your house, God will make sure that your flour never runs out and your oil never runs out and your water never runs out because God can make a way where there seems to be no way. Come on, do you receive this word today? Give God a shout of hallelujah in the house. I'm telling you, it's not over. It's not over. I look at every section and tell you it's not over. God can do something with your life. Come on, let's declare this. I sought the Lord. my brothers and sisters right now in Jesus name and I declare over every family I declare over every heart over every person over every soul I declare over every dream I declare over every gifting I declare over every idea over every business I declare in the name of Jesus it's not over I declare that this is not our final chapter I declare that there are better days and brighter days. The path of the righteous is getting brighter and brighter. And I declare that so. I declare sudden breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. I declare sudden turnarounds. Where there seems to be no way, God, you can make a way. Lord, part the Red Sea, I pray for your people today. Where it, where it feels like an impossibility in front of them. It feels like the enemy behind them. It just, it feels like they're surrounded on every, on every side. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would, you would open something. I feel that. I feel like God is opening a door. 
feel like God is opening a door of opportunity for this church and for the people of this church. I feel like, I don't think I've ever prayed this in my life, but it, I, I, I can just see that scene right out of Exodus as the, as the children of Israel are in that moment as they're leaving a season, as they're leaving Egypt and they're about to enter into a new thing and Pharaoh's doing all he can to stop that moment, but God makes a way. Some of you feel chased. You just, you feel chased by the enemy. And the promise of God was that the enemy that you see now, you will never see again. Because he was drowned in the Red Sea. He was drowned in the river. He was drowned in the presence of God. And the thing that was trying to drown you, God's about to drown in the name of Jesus. I feel this. Who am I talking to right now? I, I should have preached on this. I've never preached on this in my life. In Jesus' name. Just raise your hand if I'm talking to you right now. I feel, man, I feel, I feel chased. I feel, it's, it's like when Jesus told Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. If you see someone with their hand up, can you gently just put your hand on their shoulder right now? But I prayed for you. And I say that right now. We pray for you in Jesus' name. That the plan of hell against you, God is stopping right now. That Satan's attempt over your life, God is stopping. That Satan's attempt over your family, God is stopping in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In Jesus' name, we cancel, we cancel and we condemn the plans of hell. And we release the plan of heaven right now over your mind, over your family, over your marriage, over your children, and over your business. In Jesus' name. We declare it so. Your faith has been weak, but we pray for you now. And God breathes new life into you, and God strengthens you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Like Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, I declare right now your heart is being flooded with the light of God, the illumination of heaven. In Jesus' name, praise God. Praise God. Everybody said amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Do y'all feel a, man, I feel a breakthrough in the house right now. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Stay with me. Stay with me. Close your eyes. The presence of the Lord is here. Revere this moment. Revere this moment. You're here right now and you say, Jabin, I need Jesus in my life. I need the Lord. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to surrender my life to him. Or I need to come back to God. I've walked away from God and I need to come home. If that's you, I want to pray for you right now. It's a sacred moment, sacred space. We've stopped this entire service to give you this opportunity. I need Christ in my life. I need to give Jesus my life or I need to rededicate my life to Christ. If that's you, we're going to pray together. And you're going to say yes to the Lord. Everybody out loud, every location, online, wherever you're at, pray with me right now. Pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Jesus, be my Lord. And save me. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed, please. All over this room, keep your eyes closed. If that's your prayer, whoever you are at your seat, on the count of three, you're going to raise your hand high. You're going to raise it high enough and long enough for me to see it, acknowledge you. And we're going to just seal this moment. We're not going to make a scene out of you. We're not making a show out of you. We are celebrating the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. I'm giving my life to Christ, one, or I'm rededicating my life to Christ. If that's so many hands already going up, but you know who you are, Jabin, this is my moment. This is my moment. One, two, three. Let me see your hand all over this room. Let me see your hand. God bless you. 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 God bless you all the way up there. I see God bless you. God bless you. 
Let me see your hand. God bless you. 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 God bless you here. I just want to acknowledge this moment. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Others, others, up in the balcony, let me see. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm rededicating my life to Christ. God bless you. If you did not, I see you right here. God bless you. If you did not raise your hand and you know you should have, do it right now. Do it right now in Jesus' name. God bless you, sir. God bless you here. Many others still need to do it, right? Stop running from God. This is your moment. I'm telling you, he's been chasing you down. He's been seeking after He's been calling you by name. Lazarus, come forth. He's, he's calling you out of that thing. He's calling you out of that life. He's calling you out of your past. I give one more opportunity. Left to right, front to back. You did not raise your hand. Can you do it right now? Right now. If there's anybody else, God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, wave me down if I, if I haven't seen you yet. God bless you. God bless you right here. Ma'am, right here. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Glory to God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Praise the Lord for so many people coming to Christ. Come on, clap your hands. Come on, if you believe it's not over for you, give God a shout of praise. Amen. Thank you so much for watching the message today. And if you've stuck around to this point, we would love to get connected and learn more about you. Hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace.